On behalf of the Los Angeles County Fire Museum, welcome. I'm Randolph Mantooth. I'm honored to introduce Pioneers of Paramedicine, a unique living history of modern emergency medical services. When the television series Emergency debuted in January 1972, there were only 12 fire-based paramedic units operating in the entire United States, eight of them right here in Los Angeles County. Most of us had never heard the word paramedic before. Emergency is often credited with helping advance BLS and ALS systems across the country, but if not for the vision and perseverance of four doctors in the late 1960s, Leonard Cobb in Seattle, Eugene Nagel in Miami, Walter Graff and Michael Criley in Los Angeles, I can say with some degree of certainty that we wouldn't have had those 12 units or a television show about firefighters and paramedics until much further down the line. In the spring of 2010, we invited those four doctors to sit down together for the very first time. With cameras rolling, we asked them to take us back, back to the beginnings of mobile life support and the development of paramedicine, to give us an inside view of the first paramedic classes and to give us their perspective on the possibilities for the future. Dr. Baxter Larman of the UCLA Center for Pre-Hospital Care, Kevin Tai, my good friend and co-star on Emergency, and I were privileged to spend a day talking with the doctors individually and as a group. As a result, the LA County Fire Museum was able to preserve an important chapter in American history that all of us associated with this project are pleased to share with you. As I often say, we can't know where we're going unless we know where we've been. Pioneers of Paramedicine is the story of where EMS came from and where we can aspire to take it in the future. The more I learned about you guys, the more I realized what a, what a presence Dr. Frank Pantridge was from uh, Dublin, I believe he was? No, uh, Pantridge. Belfast. Belfast. Pel Pantridge. Pantridge. In uh, Belfast, uh, Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland, right. right. Uh, uh, and, and, and he came up with this concept that was totally alien to anything that we had going at the time. What, in 66, I believe it was, right? He published it in 66. He published it in 66. He published it. And what did he publish? He published his results. He had, <clears throat> he had, in the British Medical Journal in 66, he published his results. He'd been doing it for years. And, and what was he basically talking about? Was he talking he was about, talking about the fact that prior to his efforts, about half of the patients transported to uh, the hospital in Belfast, I think it was Queen Elizabeth, uh, <clears throat> half of them didn't get there alive until he instituted his program. We, when a call came into the hospital for an ambulance for a patient who had a heart attack, they sent out a doctor and a nurse, and they salvaged these patients. Did you hear about Pantridge, uh, like before you started thinking about uh, having a, a... Oh yeah, yeah. I think uh, Pantridge is clearly a, uh, uh, a mentor, a role model, a uh, leader for all of uh, all of this work, at least those of us in cardiology. Pantridge published a paper in about 1966 or something like that in the Lancet, the British Journal. And uh, he just described his experience. And it was, uh, you know, Pantridge's uh, uh, system, if you will call it that, really one emergency care. It was bringing coronary care unit out to Just coronary, no trauma? No, no. And it responded, you had to call up the hospital, ring up the hospital, and uh, and if it looked like it might be a heart attack, the doctor, the the um, patient's physician would go out and say, oh, it looks like a heart attack, and so he'd call up the Royal Victoria Hospital, and someone would uh, alert the ambulance uh, and the uh, and, and the registrar, the resident on, on call, the nurse, and they'd go out and see the patient. They'd save an hours, two, three, four hours sometimes 
for before a patient with myocardial infarction would get into the hospital. So it was, by, by present day standards, it wasn't a very rapid response at all, but it did shave off some time. And, and in doing this, Pantridge found out that while there was an occasional patient that had uh, myocardial infarction that had ventricular fibrillation that he could attend outside the hospital. And he had this big, uh, big defibrillator that was a huge thing. In 66? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anyhow, that that was the story, and uh, it, but it was it was a a uh, the first organized effort to bring what we now call advanced life support outside the hospital. I think we're <clears throat> inspired in a way by another cardiologist, Dr. Frank Pantridge, and he kind of invented mobile coronary care. <clears throat> he did it in Belfast, out of the Royal Vic Hospital. And he came over to the United States and was a big hero, really, to the cardiologists in this country. So I think it was mainly cardiologists who developed their own programs like Belfast of reaching out in the community. He, uh, as, as Gene <laughs> indicated, a colorful, I mean, a feisty, colorful, uh, uh, guy and he very uh, very opinionated. Uh, when something when he knew something he knew it, and he had, he had dislikes and likes in this world. And but anyhow, Pantridge was a firm believer in what he called pre um, uh, early early coronary care, which was basically what they ran out of um, out out of the garage at the Royal Victoria Hospital in Belfast. But he just had a, a marvelous. Uh, um, Fight to him that Frank uh, was uh, was just a person that uh, didn't give up, and he, by, the Brits, by and large, did not go along with his ideas about pre, about early coronary care. They thought he was crazy, and he, and he was determined to dispel that. So I think that's one of the reasons he came around to the United States, and he was generally re received with great uh, great fair, fa fanfare here, and the folks kind of loved him. But uh, he went back to, to the UK and things, uh, he, 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 he had some problems. Well, did, uh, well, did you guys, what did you learn from him? I mean, because obviously you, you didn't take his, his, his notion of, of sending doctors and, and, and nurses out into the field. You guys went a whole other way. So w what did he do that, that changed your point of view on how, how uh, emergency uh, medicine was to be, was to be implemented? Well, it, it, basically, what he did was probably not not so uh, not so important. But the the notion that we would try to move advanced what we call now call advanced life support move it out on, out of the hospital walls was was novel and uh, uh, it it was effective. Pantridge, for instance, believed that the major impact of what he was of early coronary care was in stabilization of the patient. He'd give him. Uh, he thought that under certain circumstances they should get atropine and beta blockers and morphine was, uh, and he was not a primary arith arrhythmia guy, and so that this, but he he was fixed with uh, with the notion that uh, that he his his work was right and uh, he was going to see it through. You developing um, the paramedic program. Uh, at the Daniel Freeman Paramedic School in, in Los Angeles, what was what was it that made you start doing that? I know, and and I know that we have some other physicians. Um, we had uh, Dr. Cobb, we have Dr. Nagel. You had a partner in Los Angeles, Dr. Criley. Um, what was the start of all that for you? Well, I got a phone call in 1968 from a doctor at UCLA who said one of Dr. Pantridge's associates will be at the Rand Institute tomorrow morning talking about Pantridge's work, uh, which I knew about. He had established a program in early 60s uh, using a, an ambulance with a doctor and a nurse to bring the cardiac patients to the St. Mary's Hospital in Belfast. And prior to that time, half of the patients died en route to the hospital. Mm. And he was able to save them all because they died of correctable bad rhythms. Anyway, I went to hear this man the next day and got more details about what Pantridge had been doing. 
And uh, that basically is what inspired me to get involved. When did you begin uh, defibrillation? <clears throat> when did you, did, did that all pretty much start at the same time? This is all the basic program, uh, the, uh, everything that was, uh, that was uh, starting these guys off. Uh, defibrillation was part of it along with IV innovation. Yeah, we didn't develop any new medical uh, training or uh, uh, devices or procedures. This was just taking what was available and taking it off the shelf and say, oh yeah, we'll try this out for the, uh, for the MS program. And I think the things that led to the development of, uh, of EMS, one of them you talked about was Pantridge, and that was a big one personally. But remember, coronary care units came into being in the hospitals in the 70s. Defibrillation, CPR. I mean, we're right now, we're celebrating the 50th year of, of, uh, of CPR. So um, the whole bunch of things were just waiting there to be used. And, we, we, and others used them. And so right from the very beginning, you, you took it out of the hospital and into the field. Absolutely, right yeah. from the very beginning. No use going out there empty-handed. Right, right. And so they developed, had defibrillators, and they had nurses that know how to use them, and they had monitors that could tell you what your patient was doing. And so that was sweeping across the country so that, as I say, it was 64, I think, Hughes Day had the first CCU, but then by 66 or 67, Almost every major hospital had a CCU. But then we learned the awful truth, and that is that the patient that survived to get to your CCU was a survivor. Uh, for every patient that was coming in, there were a bunch of dead bodies out there that didn't make it because they had their V-fib as at the onset of their heart attack. And so uh, Pantridge in uh, Northern Ireland and the Russians uh, were beating us to the punch in that they were developing mobile units that would go out there and, and find victims of heart attacks and protect them while they got into the hospital and developing all these protocols for how to scoop up people and get them into the hospital fast and monitor them. Johns Hopkins was also an interesting thing with the beginning of some of the CPR research. Well, not some of the CPR research. That was where CPR as we know it today was invented. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, in the lab right next to where I was director of the cardiac catheterization laboratory and they were on the same floor on the Blaylock building. And three guys, actually two of them were hard working, the other guy was just a stand in, but uh, uh, Dr. Cowenhoven, who is a professor of engineering, actually retired from the undergraduate school and he just wanted a job and so Dr. Blaylock, who was a giant in the world of surgery, he gave uh, mm -hmm. Bill Cowenhoven a job and Cowenhoven in turn was working on defibrillators because he had been hired by the telephone companies to develop a way of resuscitating people that were up on high power lines and getting zapped and so he had, a, had worked on defibrillators and so he, he probably had one of the first defibrillators ever on board and uh, he was working with a student by the name of Guy Knickerbocker and his student was uh, very energetic and enthusiastic and when they were working on different designs for defibrillator paddles he designed one paddle arrangement where you had to push really hard on the chest because he didn't want it to arc uh, you know if you mm -hmm. don't push hard enough with a paddle and so Guy was pushing hard with the paddle and Cowenhoven noted that there was a pulsation in the arterial line every time he pushed. So he said, push some more, push some more. And they eventually developed what they called external cardiac massage. Something that we haven't talked about is the word regionalization. And in 73, I think it was, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation put out a RFP for what essentially was 911. And we had 200 proposals from around the country. We site visited 100 of them, 11 of us. And we gave grants to 44. And those 44 grants were like uh, seed money around the country 
to start 911. And uh, 911 regionalized, really, emergency care in many areas of the country. So if you look at your phone book and open it up, the cover, on the inside of the cover, can be as many as 30 or 40 emergency care numbers for all the communities in that county or that region. And 911 gives you one number. And that cuts the time down appreciably. Uh, there are many other benefits of regionalization. Now, we're talking about, you know, heart. Uh, in 1966, the, the, the uh, death and disability uh, uh, white paper was written. And basically, it was nicknamed "Death in a Ditch" because yeah. we we're all dying in a ditch at that time. <laughs> mm -hmm. And 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 isn't it true at that time, 50% of all America's first responders were funeral homes because they had the vehicles. Right. Uh, of course, they saw a business opportunity. <laughs> you know, started repainting them and making them into ambulances. No, they were been good guys, Randy. Were they? <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> all right. I'll take your word for that. Okay. Um, so. This, when this white paper came, uh, came about, it wasn't just uh, cardiac events that you had to deal with. How, how did you adapt to having to deal with major traffic accidents and, and, and trauma of all kinds? Well, the white paper came out of the National Research Council, National Academy of Science uh, group. And it came out in 66 and it was called Accidental Death and Disability. And it was read by a lot of academic doctors. It was not read by mayors, uh, city councils, uh, governors. Uh, I don't think it caused as big a ripple as the historians would like to think it did. And if you want to talk about a big ripple, then the local newspapers in our various cities talking about what Dr. Cobb, Dr. Crowley, me, others were doing, that caused a bigger ripple. And then in the 70s when your program came out, that was a tidal wave. So if we, if we grade things, that white paper, it was important, but only on an academic level. Uh, and it didn't really reach the public. Uh, it, it, read, it reached some academic circles, really. But it reached you. You read it. H how did you respond to it? Well, I read it, but I read also about a British war hero, Dr. Frank Pantridge, and what he was doing. And that inspired me also. And I was reading about what happened in Seattle and Los Angeles. And in a way, Maybe Dr. Cobb and Dr. Crowley and Dr. Graff will disagree. I think we were all in a race. Really? Oh, yeah. I think we were, we were all trying our level best to create in our local area something that we could be proud of and the community could be proud of. And down the road, I don't think we were thinking really nationally at that time. In... Uh about 1974, <clears throat> Senator Cranston proposed a bill which was accepted, and the bill's purpose was that there are many medical advances that appear in the medical literature which are not being acted upon. There may be a lot of things that ought to be used by doctors throughout the country, and they're just not familiar with those things, and they should be doing more. So they established the Regional Medical Program. You remember that? Right. And I was a member of the committee at UCLA, but there were committees in every, st every state had a regional medical program. California had two, north and south. And <clears throat> when they were all through, I think the program cost $47 million. When they were all through, the one thing that had emerged in every state was expansion of the paramedic program. Did you know that when you were going to the firefighters and you were presenting them with this new concept of, of being able to take what is normally done in the hallowed halls of the, of the hospital and taking it out into the field, mm -hmm. did, did that 
feel like to you at the time, like it was a revolutionary idea? I don't think so, Randy. I think that we were trying to create this system in Miami, and we had no idea at the time that the ripples would spread around the country. It really came with your program uh, in, in a couple of years after that. But what we wanted to do was to have a program in Miami that would save lives and that would work and would do no harm and would not embarrass the fire department. We didn't want to fall on our face. So it was a step at a time and we were gradually building the program. Did, did you have resistance at that uh, from, from, from people? We had resistance, uh, I would call it more inertia. Uh, a lot of doctors thought we were going too far, too fast, and nurses particularly, uh, at that time, they couldn't start IVs, they weren't allowed to. They couldn't give medications IV. And they thought that if they couldn't do it, why would firemen with some training be allowed to do it? We had a lot of resistance, I think, from nursing. But uh, we had a lot of support from the media. The local newspapers, the local TV stations, I thought gave us tremendous support. And then when your program started, every town in America knew about the program. And they all wanted some version of it in their town. There must have been a moment where you went, this work, this person would have died had it not been for this program. Do you, can you remember that, uh, that particular? Sure I can. His name was Dan Jones. Uh, he lived in a, a kind of a uh, homeless type environment near our main station, fire station. And he, he enjoyed uh, Ripple and some other good brands of, <laughs> of uh, some beverage. Some of the expensive stuff. And uh, he was found apparently lifeless in the gutter and the rescue squad only had about two blocks to go. And they defibrillated him and Dan made it. He was our first save and came out of the hospital. And from that day on, he wore a clean white shirt. He came down to the main fire station and talked to the firemen, was very grateful. And in some of my early talks, I said that alcoholism could be cured by defibrillation. <laughs> <laughs> So he was defibrillated in the field? He was. And what year was this? 1969, June of 69. <laughs> well, it cured him, <laughs> didn't it? <laughs> when, you, when you first thought, okay, let's, let's take this, this life-saving technique outside of the hospital walls. Let's put it out in the field. Um, you chose firefighters to do that. Is there, uh, or, or did you? Well, yes and no. Uh, <clears throat> I, I really did not have a good idea as to who was providing f emergency care, first aid at the time. I did find out uh, that the fire department had a, a, a response business that it was very, it was minimal and they would send out what they called aid cars mm -hmm. and they, somebody from an engine company, some uh, person from a ladder company would respond in a double house uh, where there's both, both units. And they'd, they'd go out there. But they were maybe in a whole year, they made a few hundred runs. And it was, it was kind of minimal. But I did hear about it, so I, that's how I thought it, maybe that was the best way to tack this, uh, this program on to. So you sort of tapped into the fact that they were already showing up. Exactly. So when, uh, when day one came, they said, well, we've got to do something now, folks. So we had a doctor respond. And a doctor responded with every run for a year. And so we had the doctor. And I'm sorry, what year was this? 1970. 1970. Yeah, so, and the doctor went along with the, with the two uh, paramedics, so-called paramedics, uh, for, for a year. And that was a wonderful training experience. That, we, I learned more about how to provide training and, and uh, uh, and, and work with, with between firefighters and paramedics and, and doctors. And that experience was invaluable, having the, the physician 
and the two medics out there all the time. And what influenced you in, in developing um, the program in Los Angeles? Well, it was a, almost a perfect storm or you could call it an alignment of constellations or whatever that all things were kind of coming together. You, you will remember that in, uh, in the late 50s and early 60s, if you had a heart attack, they'd put you in the hospital and they would brush your teeth for you. They wouldn't do a rectal exam. They wouldn't do anything that might disturb you because they had, some nurse had seen a patient brush his teeth and die, so he don't brush teeth. Uh, and so we didn't know why you were dying with a heart attack. And every time you'd read in the paper that somebody had died, they always said it had, must have been a massive heart attack because he just dropped dead right there. Just uh, So there had to be a the heart must have burst in order mm -hmm. to, but as Claude Beck, the surgeon in Cleveland, said that heart was really too good to die. And so it was with the onset of monitoring, which then was coming into being as a result of the space uh, agency developing monitoring for uh, space flight. And because of the fact that we were opening up CCUs, which really weren't present until maybe 1964 and nobody uh, then was in any kind of a doubt about what killed you with a heart attack. It was V-fib mm -hmm. or a non-perfusing uh, rhythm and so they developed they had defibrillators and they had nurses that know how to use them and they had monitors that could tell you what your patient was doing. And so that was sweeping across the country so that, as I say, of 64, I think, Hughes Day had the first CCU, but then by 66 or 67, almost every major hospital had a CCU. But then we learned the awful truth, and that is that the patient that survived to get to your CCU was a survivor. Uh, for every patient that was coming in, there were a bunch of dead bodies out there that didn't make it because they had their V-fib as at the onset of their heart attack. And so uh, Pantridge in uh, Northern Ireland and the Russians uh, were beating us to the punch in that they were developing mobile units that would go out there and and find victims of heart attacks and protect them while they got into the hospital and developing all these protocols for how to scoop up people and get them into the hospital fast and monitor them. And Walter Graff, my colleague here from Los Angeles who spoke to you earlier or spoke before the cameras earlier, uh, was developing his idea, which was a little bit more like um, Pantridge's idea, and that was to have a specialized mobile unit, a kind of a CCU on wheels that was going to be manned by professional personnel, nurses in his case, in Pantridge's case, who was residents or registrars, uh, that they called them over in Northern Ireland. Anyway, we uh, had heard about Gene Nagel and his program down in, uh, in Miami, and so we put all these things together and talked to our superiors downtown and particularly got the ear of Kenneth Hahn, our wonderful supervisor for the second district, who could make things work, it made things work for Walter Graff's idea and made things work for our idea. And so they moved along very rapidly and the next thing you knew by December of 69, we actually graduated our first uh, paramedics, both from the county and the city of Los Angeles. How did you establish your heartmobile that you had in Los Angeles? Well, I knew that uh, that if you could get a person into an environment like the coronary care unit in the hospital, you'd be saving their lives. So I talked one of my patients into buying. He laid out twenty thousand dollars to buy a van, and then Supervisor Kenny Hahn modified it so it resembled a hospital room. And then it was outfitted as though it was part of a coronary care unit. And so uh, we set up a program with an ambulance company uh, where a nurse would be picked up at, by the ambulance because it was only three minutes away. And they would go out and take the patient to the hospital. Once the patient got into that van, the patient was the same as being in the hospital. So your first 
real paramedics were, were really nurses? They were real, the first group were nurses, and that went on for one year. Uh -huh. And then when the law was passed and I was able to, well, I must say that I told Supervisor Hahn that I planned on using firemen to replace the nurses. And he said, you can't do that. You've got to have a state law. And he sent me up to Sacramento to meet with Senator Wedworth. And I sat down with Senator Wedworth and we wrote a law, the Wedworth Townsend Act, which allowed paramedics. And Wedworth was very smart. The first sentence in the law says, any county with a population of over six million may do the following. And that was involved only Los Angeles County and as a consequence, nobody objected to the law. It passed without dissent and uh, became a, a method for training paramedics. So about your first class, what year was, was your first paramedic class? First class was in 1970, 1970, the first paramedic class because the law that allowed paramedics was signed by Governor Reagan in July of 1970. Mm -hmm. And three weeks later, I had my first class. That was a group of city firemen uh, and some ambulance people. When did you become aware that uh, there were other people sort of doing the same thing you were doing, to but, but yet totally independent of you, uh, that, that this idea that just all of a sudden sparked in different areas of the country. When did you become aware that other people were doing it? Well, there were roughly six spots originally. There was mine in Miami, but <clears throat> there was Dr. Grace in New York City. Dr. Grace in New Dr. York City? Dr. Grace. Mm -hmm. There was Dr. Warren in, in Ohio, Columbus. Uh, there was Dr. Criley in L.A. There was Dr. Graff in mm -hmm. L.A. Dr. Cobb in Seattle. Mm -hmm. And all five of those doctors were cardiologists. And I wasn't, I was an anesthesiologist. I was the equal opportunity guy. <laughs> we almost had simultaneously the development of coronary care in hospital, as well as we had coronary care in pre-hospital kind of going on at the same time. I, I, I thought I remember you telling me that you know, prior to much before the 1970s, coronary care units themselves were also relatively new? We, uh, the, the first article on coronary care units in the United States came from a general practitioner down south. I think he was in Alabama. It was published in the medical, in JAMA. And uh, when I read it, I immediately went to the hospital administrator and got her to agree to set aside four beds as a coronary care unit. So I had, I had one almost immediately after I read that article. And then slowly and slowly other hospitals joined the, the system. Every hospital has one now. Mm -hmm. We used a box called the Biophone. I know uh, you did. <laughs> it was red. It was red? Yeah, I well, think so. Well, ours was orange. Oh, okay. In fact, uh, didn't you, did, uh, the very first one. That was a company in California, Culver City, mm -hmm. Biocom. Biocom. And they made our, they made your, your uh, radio telemetry unit, they made our radio telemetry unit. We weren't allowed to say Biocom <clears throat> because that was a commercial, sure. so we had to say Biophone. That's fine. <laughs> you know, so, but uh, uh, you developed that, right? Well, we, we tried to get uh, NASA or uh, Zenith Radio or Motorola Radio interested, and none of them were interested in making a telemetry unit. And Biocom, if you don't mind, <laughs> right. uh, made the boxes that would work over telephone lines. And so they thought that it would work just as well over a radio, but it didn't. They had to do some special shielding and and do bypass circuitry to make it work next to a radio transmitter and it did work and we used telemetry in our first few years of operation it gave us the the medical uh mandate to give treatment in the field through the paramedic And I didn't have any idea what kind of a curriculum, what kind of a course to give them. 
So the first course was three weeks and three days. Uh, it expanded to 220 hours and then to 350 hours and then to 450 hours as we realized that there was more and more information that they had to have. So your first class was less than the now national curricula for AMT basics. It was awfully brief. I had no idea how long it should be. And it was all cardiac. And mm -hmm. then it expanded into all kinds of emergency training. Your first paramedic class, how many was there? Ten. You had ten. And they all, they all passed. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I think maybe one guy dropped out, but <clears throat> no. we didn't have any standards to, <laughs> to funk them anyhow. What there. year was that? We started in 1969, 69. and they finished up in 1970. Now, out of these 10, are they still around? Uh, they're still walking and talking, yeah. yeah. Uh, they're not, I don't think any of them are still working, though. No. no. But they were all firefighters. They were all firefighters. And to this day, all the paramedics are, fire, have, are, are firefighters that have right. ex experience in the field. What we did do was to train the firemen at night, uh, after hours, in some of the laboratories for the medical school. And we would work on dogs and give start IVs, give drugs, defibrillate, we'd fibrillate and then defibrillate. And so a lot of our training was in the laboratories of the medical school for the firemen. And then later uh, uh, we would uh, train them in techniques such as uh, intubation teaching them to put in the endotracheal tubes and so forth. The, uh, how did they take to it? Did, did they all, obviously, they all volunteered, right? They were all volunteers. Uh, they were all rescue officers. Uh, they were very experienced. And they were enthusiastic, practical. Uh, they were fun to work with. Uh, and in some ways, uh, they were easier to teach than a medical student because a medical student, after a year or two, he knows everything there is to know. <laughs> but the firemen were, they were eager to learn and they had a lot of good ideas themselves. They knew the street, which I didn't. And we had a lot of give and take in those sessions. Do, do you have a, a, a preference or, or do you have an opinion on whether uh, the privatization of, of paramedics uh, is a good thing um, or, um, or to have a fire-based uh, paramedic system? Is there, do you think it's just whatever works? Well, <clears throat> You realize you're putting me on the hot seat. I, I, I do, and I apologize <laughs> for that, but I have to put you on that seat. If the fire-based system, which is true of most big cities, most big cities have fire-based EMS. I think it's great. Uh, but there are some private systems that are also great. Uh, Acadian in Lafayette, Louisiana, and now it's all over Louisiana, in New Orleans, it's into parts of Texas, it's in parts of Mississippi. The Acadian system is also a great system, and it's private. It's 85% employee owned. And uh, the, one of the problems, uh, Randy, is most of the medical articles are written by medical schools. And they're mostly in bigger cities. So most of the literature is about systems in Houston, Philadelphia, New York, Minneapolis, wherever. Uh, but what about Sedalia, Missouri, uh, a small town in Nebraska? What about all the other towns that are 10,000, 20,000, 50,000 population? And some of them are volunteer, some of them are private, some of them are fire. Uh, do they work? Do they satisfy the needs of the community? Nobody writes articles about them. And I think the light needs to shine on all the different areas. Uh, 
mountain rescue, uh, wilderness rescue, small town rescue. It all needs to be told. Are you satisfied with the way EMS has finally developed, has finally evolved into? Do you, do you see room for improvement or h how do you view what's hmm. happening today? I think that a lot of the early development of the program was, can we do this? Is it necessary? Will it save lives? And down the road, we have to look at what we did then, what we do now, to see, is it necessary? Does it save lives? Uh, is it practical? Is it cost effective? And that type of scrutiny is still ongoing. And I don't think we know exactly where it ought to be, maybe somewhere in the middle. Do we do too much? Do we do too little? Uh, those are questions that I think we still need to answer. Uh, I think that in the early days, if we could do it, and if it seemed to save lives, that was enough. Now I think, how many lives do we save? Do we cause any harm? Uh, is it cost effective? I think those questions are still out there. What is the, um, um, talking about research and getting into research and getting into new equipment, telemetry, and in terms of just the history of the program, where, where did we start and where are we going and uh, what kind of research are we doing to keep us going in the right direction? Out of hospital research. Well, most of the, the uh, effort in pre-hospital emergency care, I think, is not well um, validated and I mean, there's a lot of process measurements that they measure the blood pressure or they do this or they do that but there are relatively few indices of outcome that can be used and the management of cardiac arrest is the thing that stands out that this is the singly best indicator of the effectiveness of the emergency care system mainly because it's measurable it's dramatic and uh, you, you're not going to make too many mistakes if you call it yes or no. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and there have been, there's a number of, uh, of areas that are being investigated in terms of uh, improving outcomes of patients with cardiac arrest. Uh, there's a resuscitation outcomes consortium that's got 10 areas of the United States, mostly metropolitan areas. And they're investigating a number of, uh, of ways to try to improve the outcome of patients with, uh, with cardiac arrest. Are these national researchers? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's, uh, let's see, uh, uh, Seattle and King County is one. Uh, there's a couple of Canadian ones in there, Vancouver and, uh, and Toronto, uh, Pittsburgh, uh, Alabama, Iowa, a few others. I hope you've been as enlightened and inspired by these remarkable men as I was. This project was made possible by the volunteer efforts of the Pioneers of Paramedicine Committee and the Board of Directors of the Los Angeles County Fire Museum and through generous contributions from our sponsors, Phillips and the Massimo Corporation. For more information, please visit the museum's website at lacountyfiremuseum.com. This is Randolph Mantooth. Thank you for joining me.